Alright. Um, yeah, so uh, today I'm going to talk about how to use machine learning to help chip design automation. Uh, first, like, how many of you are actually uh, familiar with uh, chip design, uh, especially digital circuit designs? Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, so um, that makes my job easier because I have to. I saw like this is a big data <laughs> community, and uh, um, maybe I have to go from the basics like uh, how to design chips. But. All right. Um, so this is my outline. Um, so I'm gonna uh, still talk about a little bit about the what data what data automation is, right? And uh, and then I will um, introduce several applications of using machine learning to. Uh, design chips. Uh, some of these applications are the research uh, projects that we are uh, we were doing. Um, some of them are um, because it's uh, like a, uh, other research groups uh, contributions. Um, and uh, that will be conclusion at the end. Okay, so that's how is design automation. So for those of you that are not really familiar with uh, how chip is designed, um, Basically, the process is like we have uh, design engineers that you know ha ha has ideas, and they write code, right? Um, we call it RTL or System C, and then the design automation is a set of tools and flows that's going to convert um, these codes into layout, right? So on the right is the the, the layout of what the Zebra chip I just I just mentioned. Um, so it's like a compiler, right? If you uh, for many of the software, um, and uh, so let me show you like one um, design automation flow that uh, we use for uh, digital circuit design. Um, the, basically, the uh, there's a design specifications that you want you know the design you want to implement, and the design engineer is going to write uh, basically write, you know um, write it into code. So you can write in high level languages such as system C, or you can write it in low level languages such as RTL, um, which require a lot in the US. Um, and uh, if you write in system C, you can use high level synthesis uh, tool to uh, basically compile that into RTL. Um, and then uh, we'll use synthesis tool uh, to convert the RTL back to actually to gate level naturalist. Um, so at this time, uh, it's no longer a code anymore. It's a it's a net list uh, with gates, um, and then we run physical design tools that's going to uh, basically create a layout. Right? Layout means gates are placed uh, in the in a in a dial, like the rectangular things that you just saw. Um, and then and this layout uh, will be sent to manufacturing companies such as TSMC. Um, and they will make wafers, and the wafers will be dissected into dyes um, and packaged into chips, and then we'll test it as well um, to make sure it's actually uh, working. Right? And then the, the ones that pass the test will be shipped to customers. So, uh, so in addition to the main flow, uh, there are also a lot of things going on. For example, um, you, you have to check that the, the RTL that you implemented uh, it's actually uh, doing the things that you really wanted to do, as the same as your design spec, right? So that's called a functional verification. Um, and then, um, because uh, the newer uh, technologies uh, is very difficult to manufacture, um, so when we're doing the physical design, when we're doing the layout, we need to make sure this layout can be actually manufacturable. So that's called a, a manufacturability test. Um, and then, of course, we want to make sure that the designs are testable by the test machines. Um, that means you also need to make sure that when you generate the design, those circuits can be tested. So that's testability problems. The reason I'm mentioning to give you the high level pictures here is uh, I will actually show you applications in some of these areas. And uh, uh, when I talk about these applications, now you have, you have an idea. Of uh, uh, what it's actually talking about, you know, in the overall design flow. Question? Yeah. Um, so, so say, say you come up with new hardware one year. Are you rewriting the programs, or are you changing the compiler to Good compile question. to a more sophisticated? Yes. So, um, of course, we're writing new program, right? Uh, new architectures, new ideas, right? Um, and uh, uh, because so the chip design industry uh, has many uh, players. 
So Amedia is a design company. So design company basically most using the tools, right? So using this uh, uh, design automation tools built by uh, other EDA companies such as Cadence or Synopsys. So uh, when I talk about tools, uh, most of the tools are built by those companies. Um, but we also have um, many engineers working on how to uh, build a system, like system of tools, we call it flow, to uh, basically uh, our own design methodologies are implemented with our own flow. So basically, the, it's like a, um, if you have a PyTorch, you know, that, that's the tools that EDA company provides us tools, but you write your own model, right? You write your own training model. So it's the same kind of analogy here. So the design company has to write their own flow based on the functionalities provided by uh, EDA companies, the tools they provide, the softwares. Uh, and in, in addition to that, the, uh, they might choose to write uh, their own uh, in-house tools uh, just because sometimes the uh, other tools is just not uh, capable of dealing with the, the, the chips they want to design. Okay. Okay, um, so uh, why are we are talking about design automation? Um, because right now there's like a two micro trend that I'm seeing. Um, first is the end of technology scaling. Right? Um, so uh, everybody familiar with Moore's law. Uh, so and so you know that Moore's law is actually ending. Right? Um, and chances that cannot double in every one and a half and or two years. It's not happening. Um, and uh, also there's the deny scaling, uh, which basically saying that uh, you know, power, power equals to CFV square, uh, which means if you uh, reduce your voltage um, by half, you can actually increase your frequency uh, for uh, four times, right? Four times. Um, so that where, where you can maintain the constant power. So that law uh, actually helps uh, helped us to see uh, CPU performance increase, like the, the frequencies increase uh, uh, exponentially kind of through the years. Um, but this, that law was uh, broken since 2005, right? Because uh, leakage power and other things that just, you cannot maintain a, a constant power uh, with uh, a high frequency. So that means uh, to get a better design, uh, how do you do that? You, you cannot just say, you know, let's wait two years and, uh, and then build a cheap uh, with, with a you know, better technology. Um, like for example, like today's uh, like AMD 7 nanometer chip uh, compared to our 12 nanometer chip, right? So you cannot say that 7 nanometer chip is better than 12 nanometer chip uh, just because scaling, it, it doesn't help that, that much. Um, now, um, so what people do is uh, they have to come up with better design ideas, right? Uh, build a smarter design. The other way they can do it, uh, actually uh, increase their uh, performance is by having better design innovation, right? Better compilers, right? So, because there's a lot of margins on, on these automatic tools um, that uh, uh, squeeze and uh, actually produce better results for you. And second micro trend is the uh, rising design cost. So, uh, as this graph shows, uh, in 14 nanometer, right, on the right-hand side, um, the design cost is like a uh, hundred million dollars, right? Uh, including design and the verification, hundred million dollar. Um, so no, not many people can do this anymore. Um, so to reduce the design cost, what do you do, right? You increase the productivity, right? Uh, if you need a uh, hundred engineers to build a chip, um, if you increase the productivity by twi uh, twice, right, then you only need fifty engineers. Um, so. But how do you improve your design productivity? Um, you can build a better design automation, right? Let the machine do the job for you. Okay, so uh, uh, now we have uh, a opportunity, right? Which is the machine learning. And uh, we know that machine learning have uh, achieved uh, greater success in various areas, like in uh, image recognition, in uh, AlphaGo plane, uh, in autonomous driving and in uh, language processing, understanding language recognition. Um, so the question is, uh, can we use machine learning to improve the design automation? 
such that we can get better quality results and better productivity. Right. So that's the, the question we, we're trying to address today. OK, um, now let's uh, talk about applications. Um, so in my mind, I think there are uh, three major categories of applications that we can do with machine learning uh, for design automation. Um, there are uh, prediction, generation opti optimization. And uh, they uh, line up well with the classification of uh, uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, such as supervised learning, uh, supervised learning, and uh, reinforcement learning. Right. Um, so let's uh, start with uh, prediction first. So um, prediction uh, is basically trying to predict some results that you uh, are not sure of. Right. So in the in the design flow, uh, there's a lot of uh, places that you can uh, we can use the prediction. Um, and the uh, typical predict prediction, uh, basically we do supervised learning, right? Um, based on the design data, uh, we know what's the uh, labels for that prediction. And we train a model such that when we see new data, we can predict uh, uh, their, their labels. And here I'm going to introduce uh, um, four applications uh, for test case uh, <laughs> scenarios. Um, it's uh, basically, first one is a DRC prediction uh, with classical machine learning methods. Uh, second is a uh, power prediction with uh, convolutional neural network. Uh, and then third is DRC hotspot prediction with uh, fully convolutional networks. And fourth is testability prediction with graph convolution networks. And uh, uh, let's start. So um, just keep, you know, uh, mention one. Uh, different uh, the difference between classical machine learning and deep learning, right? Because I made a difference uh, here that uh, um, the first project actually is uh, using classical machine learning, and uh, the rest of uh, them are actually uh, in the deep learning category. Um, that we know that deep learning usually give you better results uh, when you have a large amount of data, right? Um, so. In the chip design, uh, we usually have a large amount of data. Yes, the chip is very complex. Um, and um, another benefit is uh, uh, for deep learning, uh, we don't really need a very sophisticated uh, feature engineering. Um, so that's also very helpful. So the first application uh, is to do congestion and DLC prediction. So uh, that's just the uh, uh, Briefly, talk, introduce this problem first. Um, like I said in the, in the previous slide, uh, when you have RTL, which is the code that you want to digital design, uh, you run through synthesis and the physical design and generate the layout. Right. So during physical design phase, um, there's uh, maybe three steps, three major steps. First, you place all the gates uh, on the layout, and then you you do some optimization, uh, and then you have to route it right, to connect connecting the uh, gates uh, with wires. Um, oftentimes, we found that uh, uh, it's very difficult to route. So, if you look at the, uh, the this layout image, you, you can see there's some red uh, spots. Those are the congested areas. That means basically routes going through that area uh, will have to basically have very difficult to uh, put all those wires going through those areas, uh, which will result in DRCs. Uh, DRC means design rule checking errors. Um, that means it's not manufacturable. Right? So the manufacturing companies, they design some rules and say, you cannot put two wires so close. Right? You know, wires has to be far away from each other. Uh, and those are those kind of DRC, called the DRC rule, DRC checks. Um, and the, if the routing is congested, uh, it's very easy to violate those DRC rules, causing DRC violations, which means the chip is not manufacturable. Um, so, Usually, the designers uh, only knows the, the DRC uh, violations uh, after the entire flow is finished, right? Until they, only after they have the layout analyst, you know, they have to route it first. Um, but if, if we go, go through the entire process and then come back to fix it, uh, it's just too slow. Um, so usually this process probably take a few days. Uh, even with today's very fast computer. Um, so, so what I mean is like going from synthesis all the way to layout at least. On a uh, surface design, it will take a few days. 
Um, so here, if we can predict the congestion really early on, uh, like you know, in a placement stage or even in the synthesis stage, then uh, we can do something about it to relieve that, that those congested areas. Uh, so that's why we need this prediction, right? So basically, you want to predict the routing congestion at early stage, early design stage. Um, so the approach is um, this approach is uh, using classical machine learning, uh, such as like SVM kind of approach. Um, so usually you have uh, input features and you have output labels. So here, the, what's the feature? Um, in this work, they take a window-based approach. So they uh, divide the entire layout area into multiple grids. And for each grid, they uh, pick a window uh, in uh, around that uh, uh, grid. And then they collect some information from that window. Right? Information such as like pin densities, cell densities, uh, the overlapping resources, pin proximities, so those are the information that's readily available uh, at early design stage uh, without going through detail routing. Uh, so they take that information within that window and they basically build a data set. Right? Um, and uh, the data set will have labels that uh, basically after detail routing, you know, okay, in this, uh, on this grid, there is some DRC violation, there is some congestion. So they can build a data set to match that. And uh, this way, they can directly predict the routing congestion and DRCs. So this is the results. Um, on the left is uh, uh, it's comparing a global routing based prediction uh, versus this SVM based prediction. Right. So uh, there are e very simple uh, global routing algorithms that you can use to predicting routing congestions. Um, but the, in this picture, it's saying that uh, uh, it's not as close as the SVM based prediction. So the, the red dot here uh, are the spots predicted by global routing, but the blue dots are the real DRC errors. So uh, we can see that the global, if, if you just run a global routing algorithm, um, it doesn't give you a very good prediction because the red dots and blue dots doesn't match. However, if you use uh, the SVM based approach, uh, looking at features in, in the nearby windows and try to predict the DRCs, uh, the, the predictions are more closer, uh, more accurate. Okay, uh, another prediction kind of project is uh, about power. So uh, the power consumption of chip is very important. Uh, so usually uh, the design team will um, do a lot of power simulations to estimate the power consumption of the chip they design. Uh, typically, this is done on a gate level method list, uh, which have millions or hundreds of millions of gates. Um, so that uh, kind of power simulation runs very slow. Um, usually, it's like um, 10 to 100 cycles a second. Uh, that means if you uh, need to run some applications, get the entire power chase, for the application, uh, it will take a very long time to generate power estimation. Um, but it's very accurate. Now, um, you can also estimate the power at the higher level. Uh, for example, you can estimate power at the system C level or RTL level. Uh, at those levels, uh, the simulation runs faster. So uh, you'll get your result faster, maybe at 1,000 or 10,000 cycles a second kind of simulation. Um, but the downside is it's not very accurate um, because it doesn't have the information of the netlist. It doesn't know which case uh, is going to consume power. It only knows the RTL code. So um, the goal here is to see if we can use a machine learning model uh, to um, predict the gate level uh, power um, from the system C and RTL simulations. I'm right? trying to bridge these two words, uh, taking the benefit of us. So now you can see uh, the speed of the model is very important. Um, that's why we um, investigate uh, fast CNN techniques. Um, so over the years, people have developed many CNN models, um, and uh, some of them have uh, 
uh, a lot of model a lot of parameters, uh, somewhat less parameters. Um, so if you plot them on the, uh, basically the x-axis is the computing complexity of the G, uh, number of uh, G-flops, and uh, uh, on the y-axis is the accuracy of the model on the image net. Um, then you, you can see something like this. So ideally, we want the, a fast model to be on the uh, upper left hand side, right? The higher up to the upper left corner, the better, which means the you know the, the smallest computing complexity with the highest accuracy. Um, now uh, we found a lot model called ShuffleNet V2, uh, which sits nicely uh, near the uh, upper left corner. And um, so that's the model we want to use. Okay, so how did it work? Um, basically, given the netlist, um, you have, let's say in this example, we have five registers, A, B, C, D, E, um, and we have uh, gates connecting them. Uh, now from the RTL simulation, uh, we know the uh, traces on each registers. So we know the uh, A, B, C, D, E, uh, and their values uh, through time. So here we have maybe three cycles. So you can, you can see that A, B, C, and D e have uh, different values through the time. Um, now, basically we want to predict the power at each cycle, right? Um, based on these traces. And uh, on, the, on the, that the picture shows that um, we have a ground truth of power and we have this uh, predictive power. We want to see the um, the ground truth and predict how our close that's the goal. Okay, uh, so how do we leverage the CNN model we just mentioned? Um, first, we have to convert that trace file into a image, right? Because we're talking about the image-based CNN model. Um, so we have five registers. That means uh, we need to somehow create an image with that five register. So we can create a three by three. Uh, image, right? So if I see element image, um, and then we can map that A, B, C, D, E uh, registers to pixels on the image. Okay, so that's how we map it. And uh, this image uh, net uh, CNNs has three layers uh, in the RGB. Uh, in this case, we actually map the switching activity uh, of the uh, each registers into three channels. So uh, a register can either stay constant or switching from zero to one or from one to zero, right? Um, so we can create three channels to map that activity. So that's kind of like one hot encoding uh, on the uh, on these channels. So now we have uh, uh, images of three channels that we can run through the shuffle net v2, which will generate uh, our number and that number will uh, doing uh, a regression loss uh, with the uh, actual ground truth. So now we have a model to predict the uh, power traces, power, uh, powers directly from the, the trace. And here's some results, right? Um, so we, we're comparing the, the CNN-based methods with um, uh, classical machine learning methods, such as uh, uh, actually boost uh, linear regression or even uh, MLP. Uh, and uh, also within CNN, we choose to uh, we run several uh, variants of the CNN, uh, not on the model itself, but on how we uh, map the traces into images, basically how we do feature engineering. Uh, so we have tried the three uh, different way of mapping the registers to, uh, to, the, to the image. And we found that the, um, the CNN-based method has a, a better performance as accuracy uh, when the design is large, right? So if you look at the, uh, all those designs, um, there's an adder pipe, pipe, pipelines, or mud pliers, uh, risk five cores. Um, we see that the, on the uh, smaller designs, uh, basically the, uh, all this, uh, except for risk five cores, so everything else is relatively small. Um, the performance of a classical machine learning based model and CN model is similar. However, on the, um, on the risk-life core, which, have, which is much larger than the others, 
we can see the same base commands will outperform all the other classical machine learning models uh, because they have uh, better complexity. Um, the, uh, and also, if you look at the uh, variance of CNN models, they don't vary much. So it doesn't matter how I encode that traces into images. The results are pretty much the same. So we should also prove the, the, the notion that you don't really need to do a lot of feature engineering uh, with CNN, with deep learning models. OK, so uh, another model is uh, the problem, uh, which I'm sorry, is uh, also related to DRC. But here we are trying to predict uh, the hotspots. Um, so basically, given images of the layout, uh, we want to predict uh, where the, the DRC hotspot will be. Um, so these images can be pin density map, macro placement map, uh, some sort of uh, uh, global routing estimate. Uh, we call it this Ruby. It's just a basically global routing algorithm. Uh, so with these inputs images, we want to see can we produce directly produce an output map uh, that can predict which one uh, or which area has uh, has DRC. So here we um, we leverage this uh, uh, model called uh, uh, fully convolutional networks. Uh, the difference between this network and the CNN is uh, uh, it has this uh, unsampling uh, upsampling layers that can uh, increase the dimension of your uh, activation layers. Um, so basically, if starting from an image, like a cat's pictures um, on the left, uh, it does convolutions to reduce the image size. And then it does the um, upsampling, uh, we call the transpose convolutions, to increase the image size. So at the end, you can also generate an image. Right? So it's from image to image. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it was proposed to do uh, image segmentation kind of work. Uh, and uh, we think we can uh, leverage this model to uh, basically try to predict a hotspot map. Right? So given an a input layout, can we produce a host, uh, DLC hotspot map at the end? So this is the model we have. Um, Basically, it's just doing the exact same thing uh, in the last picture, the last slides. You know, we take an input image with W times H uh, pixels, uh, and with convolutions, we reduce the uh, and the pooling, uh, we do reduce the, the size of the, the image to uh, uh, one quarter so for W, and then with upsampling, we com come back to the uh, original image size. And the last function is basically just uh, an output. We know where's the DRC. We, we know the, the uh, labels. We just do a, a, a last regression loss on the output. So here's uh, um, some results. So in the center is the ground truth. So those are the hotspots, ground truth. On the left side is the, we use the, uh, the method that we talked about at the beginning, the window-based classical machine, uh, machine learning approach to predict the DRC. Um, they, they, are, uh, they can predict some of the hotspots, but they also create a lot of false, neck, false positives. Um, on the right-hand side is the LoudNet, which actually predict the, uh, uh, pretty well. The, the hotspots is uh, correlated well with the uh, branches. And the reason is uh, uh, the window-based approach it doesn't see the entire image. Um, it only sees a local window. Now, in this design, they have a lot of big macros that, that span across the, the window. Uh, so the window-based approach cannot even see those information. Now, with this uh, fully uh, convolution neural networks, uh, you, each pixel is able to get information from uh, neighboring or even far away pixels. So that's why the prediction is more accurate. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about uh, some problems in testing. Oh, sorry. Okay. So how do you use these algorithms? Do you uh, use the EDA tools where it can place, where it can improve the testing <coughs> graph, or is that something you do iteratively? Right. So uh, there are ways for you to manipulate the design. Um, so let's say if you know that uh, this area is congested. What you do is you are uh, like creating some uh, expansion factors for the cells in that area. 
then they will just push themselves away from that area. Uh, and this can be manipulated by design team or by tag tools. So uh, either um, basically the, the, the design team can, can have script to do this, or the cat tool can provide features to do this. So, so it's, uh, once you have the methods, um, it can be uh, implemented by both the, the company, uh, the EDA companies or all the other companies. So, so once you've done the placement, then you use the data, you run it through this model, and then you provide feedback back into the design. Right. Right. So, so, so the you 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 train this model offline, right? So you 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 do uh, you did a lot of place results with that data you, you produce this model. Um, once you have the model, then we have a new data. You can just do inference. You inference this uh, to get the congestion map, DRC map of your new design, and then you can do something very very early on, right? not until you uh, route and finish the DRC checking done. What, yeah. does, what does the image look like that goes into that model? Is it like all the components, literally like a camera shot, or is it some other representation that you create? Yeah, so it is uh, uh, basically, it's not a camera shot, uh, uh, because it depends on dimension. So if we have a thousand by thousand dimensions, but the, the, the chip image, if you look at the layout, it's a much larger dimension than that. So uh, we will actually, uh, creating features for each grid. So it's like a, um, aggregating information within that particular grid, and that's my features inside that grid. So I, I don't know if that explains well. Uh, basically, the, the, if, if you think about that, images uh, dimensions maybe uh, uh, 1,000 by 1,000. And within that, each grid, so each grid of that 1,000 by 1,000, Pixels, but uh, each pixel of that thousand by thousand images is uh, is basically a, some rectangle areas uh, on that chip, and then you have to uh, search for all the cells that actually uh, so overlap with that small rectangles, and then collecting the features from that small rectangle and put it on a pixel. Make sense? <laughs> all right. Okay, um, so, oh, hello? So when, when you talk about the features, are you are you taking in the engineer's input to get it done, or it's kind of self-trained, how, how do you? Yes, um, so the, it is uh, based on the, uh, let's see, yeah, okay, this is, so we have four channels for, for this uh, model. So there are uh, pin density map, right? That mean, means uh, in that rectangle area, how many pins are there? Right? Uh, macro map, uh, whether there's a macro on this uh, uh, rectangle. Uh, long range Rudy and Rudy pins, those, those are just uh, some global routing estimates um, that actually pass into that rectangles. So, um, I mean, you can create your own features, but this is basically uh, collecting features. Um, Okay, um, the, the reason I want, I want to talk about testing is because I want to introduce a new model and uh, this graph-based model. I think it's a very exciting model to use in the chip design area, um, chip design um, related project, machine learning projects. So just a little bit of overview of what's chip test, how do we test the chip, right? So um, basically, if you think about the chip is accepting some inputs and generating some outputs. Uh, so the, the way we test it is we send a whole bunch of uh, inputs to the chip, and then we check the output, right? And we try to match that output with my golden set of outputs. If they match, that means it's a good chip. If it doesn't match, it's a bad chip. Right? It's a very uh, simple way of explaining what testing is. So what will happen is uh, if there's a failure on the chip, uh, for example, some nets get stuck at zero, uh, you know, some shorts happen in the layout, that this, this signal just always zero, it's not, not going to turn. Then um, if you apply some in inputs, the, the outputs might, might be might changed, and then it doesn't match your golden outputs anymore. So you know that's a failed chip. Now there's some problem because uh, not every uh, signal on the chip is testable. Um, I can show you like one very simple example. 
let's say uh, you have this kind of circuits. Now, if you look at the, um, the output of A, right, that gate, um, it's going to be almost always zero because uh, it's a, it's a, the function of the gates is depend on uh, the end function of uh, a lot of inputs. Right? So uh, basic uh, uh, Boolean logic, uh, you know that uh, it's very difficult to get A to be, to be one because it requires all that, or every input to be one. Right, so that's a very low probability to have uh, every input to be one. That means uh, the outputs of the circuits O will always be zero. Uh, because you know, if one of the, uh, the A is zero, then the output of course is zero because it's connected by N gates. So now there's a problem because if I have a stuck at fault at the uh, B, uh, that fault cannot be observed because it doesn't change the output. Right, it doesn't matter whether my B is one or zero. As long as A is zero, my output is always zero. So I just cannot observe this fail, this fault. Um, so this is called a very diff called a difficult to test points on the design. And uh, uh, the way people handle this is by increase inserting actual registers uh, on this particular point. So you can actually observe uh, this point directly. So the problem is trying to estimate, uh, trying try to estimate where is this uh, difficult test point, uh, which we have some algorithm to estimate it, but take a long time. Uh, so we're thinking, can we use machine learning algorithms to estimate uh, where are the difficult test points? So basically, it's giving us a netlist. Can I use machine learning algorithms to estimate which signals, which nets in this design? It's a very difficult task, right? So that's uh, basically the problem. Uh, and uh, we have input features. And these features are things like uh, logic level, which is uh, how far away are these gates to the inputs. It could be one level, two level, three level away. Um, or, and then we have scope values. And these are just uh, very simple algorithms that compute the uh, controllabilities and observabilities of the circuits. Um, I don't go on the detail and explain these algorithms, but it's just a uh, very simple algorithm that you can run and get some number that can use as the input features. And then we, the output is we want to predict whether uh, if we can classify that which node is difficult to test or not. And those those uh, labels could be is generated by uh, some touch of max, which is a uh, they put uh, having the probabilities, or do you have some kind of a distribution based on this? Input probabilities. Um, no, the this this input features is based on the circuits you have. So taking your skewing your circuits, I can generate the input features. Right, so for you know a hundred inputs into your design, uh, not all inputs have the same probability of being turned on. No, that's that's not uh, that's not it. So each input. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, I think I, I'm probably misleading you. Uh, when I say input, I'm talking about the input to the model, to the machine learning model. So, so, so the, the features are on each gate. So on each gate of the design, we have four numbers, okay, as inputs to the machine learning model. Okay, now uh, let's talk about the graph convolutional networks. And uh, um, basically the, um, it's called TCN, it's a, a neural model to handle graph. Uh, what it does is basically aggregate information from, from neighboring nodes, uh, as shown in this uh, animation. Um, so compared to the CNN, right, which actually does this kind of aggregation uh, on neighboring pixels, right? So they, they have these kernels that run on a window. Uh, that's basically, you know, aggregating information from the neighboring pixels. GCN is aggregating information from their neighboring node. Right? Once that information are aggregated by either a mean function or some function, uh, they will apply an encoding step to map the feature space from low dimension to a high dimension. And also you can apply random functions as well. So that's called a one GCN layer. Uh, this is the mass for this layer. Uh, for the our problem, right, we are given a circuit, we map that into graph. Uh, so each node in the graph is, uh, is a gate. 
and the edges are the net connecting the gates. And then we can go through this uh, DCN layers, uh, maybe three layers. And at the end, we'll have node embeddings on each, uh, each node. And then we can apply fully connect layers to predict whether this, this uh, node is testable or not based on our label. And uh, initial labels on each node is just uh, the four numbers I talked about, logical levels and three scope values. And this shows the uh, prediction accuracies. Um, so we can see that the, um, the accuracies improves uh, when you have, of course, more epochs, chain epochs, and also improves when you have more TCM layers. So k equals to three will already give you like 90% accuracy. Uh, and on the right hand side, it's comparing GCN with other machine learning models like uh, Random Forest uh, SVM. Uh, and you can see that the, the GCN model applied to this model, uh, applied to this uh, problem, have much higher uh, accuracy than the other models. And with this model, we are able to produce our, our own test point insertion flow that actually. Um, uh, did a better job than some commercial the commercial tools, uh, so we can have much less number of test points inserted with this prediction model. And then we think the graph model is very common uh, for a lot of these automation problems. Uh, and I think it, it will be useful for a, a lot of other prob uh, areas as well. Okay, now I think we covered the prediction problems pretty well, and. Uh, I also I'm gonna switch gears to about the generation problem, optimization problems, basically unsupervised learning and uh, uh, reinforcement learning. Um, these are still uh, new areas for design design automation. So well, we don't have a lot of our, uh, works in this area, but uh, there are some uh, interesting works that uh, basically shows uh, the benefits of applying um, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. Um, so the first. Uh, Project so is uh, called the OPC mask generation with generative adversarial networks. Again. And second project is called logic optimization with reinforcement learning. Um, so, for the first problem, uh, the OPC problem, let me just uh, briefly uh, talk about the problem first. So, on the uh, advanced technology, if you want to build a rectangle, right, um, you cannot just uh, Build a mask of a rectangle because if you build that, the lithography uh, will generate uh, a shape like a uh, folding bin, right? So it's not going to be rectangle anymore. Uh, so what you do is you you do something called a, a optical proximity correction for the RPC that's going to add actual shapes on this original rectangles such that after lithography, the Silicon image will look like a rectangle. So, how to generate this uh, OPC layout? Uh, usually, people what they do is they uh, they have a target shape. Um, they then they use something called the inverse lithography transform, basically trying to inverse the the lithography equations to compute the shapes that is required to actually generate the real the real uh, shapes on the wafer. Uh, so that's a very computation ex uh, expensive uh, 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 task, uh, usually taking uh, hours or days of kind of computing power. Um, so uh, this work is trying to use leverage GAN. Um, so uh, I guess many people know GAN, basically there's a generator and a discriminator. Right? So generator will take in random noise and generate an image. And the uh, discriminator will try to identify which one is a real image and which one is a generated image. So all the time, the discriminator is so good that the generator has to generate a real you know, images that like the real image. So here, um, basically, we want to use the, this generator here to directly generate uh, the LPC mask uh, from the target. So that's the this work uh, is trying to achieve. So given a task image, uh, given a target image, uh, they use an autoencoder to generate a mask. Um, and uh, that mask and the, the target are feed back to the discriminator to check whether it's good mask or bad mask. Right? 
So uh, if we, they have many uh, 10 examples, they can make this generator very good at generating OPC mass directly from the target. And on top of that, uh, because they cannot achieve exact solution, so on top of that, once they have a generator to generate the, the, the mask, uh, they also apply the ILT, the inversely software transforms, to basically fine tune that image to something that, that's actually useful. So that's the uh, using the, gener the generator approach. Now talk about the optimization with reinforcement learning. Um, one problem that the, which is applicable is called the logic optimization problem. Um, so uh, basically for logics, you can uh, it, uh, construct logic with this thing called a uh, majority inverted graph. Uh, what it does is uh, uh, the circuits uh, can be represented in, in this graph. And uh, how the goal is to either reduce the area of the graph or reduce the depth of the graph. Right? So in this case, it's a three level depth on the left side. So there's a transforms that you apply to the graph such that at the end, you will have shorter depths, depths right? So at the end, this is a depth equals to two instead of three. So that's optimization. Um, so <laughs> we can map this into reinforcement learning problem. And uh, just a short introduction of reinforcement learning problem. Um, basically, you will have a reward, right? Um, in the game scenario, the reward is the score you scored, and you have states. Uh, and uh, in this game, uh, the state is the screen. And you have action, uh, which is maybe move your move your objects back and right. And you have an action value function, Q, which is basically predict the future total rewards on current states and the action. Um, and you can have a policy function that basically tells you the probability of which action to choose. Um, and then you can use the policy gradient uh, to train a model that's going to produce the probability of all these actions. So in this case, uh, let's say you have three actions, left and right and fire, then this network is going to train uh, a value, predict a value on whether you move to left or whether you move to right or, or fire, um, have probabilities that you can train. And uh, now, how do we use this for optimization problem, right? So basically, we just need to map the reward function uh, as logic depth reduction, right? So if I'm reducing my, taking a transform, if I'm reducing my logic depth from three to two, now I have reward of one, right? Uh, and what is state? State is current graph, the current circuit graph. Um, and we can use actually GCN, the graph web networks, to learn the graph state. So basically, you have the encode embeddings on the, on the GCN. Um, and uh, what's the action? Action is actually the, the transform you use. So for each given state, you can have a, only a limited number of transform you can do. So that's the action. Uh, and the policy is basically computer probabilities of uh, which move you take, which transform you apply to the graph uh, given that state. So, so that's how, how you uh, transform the logic optimization problem into uh, reinforcement learning problems. And that actually uh, shows a uh, very good results from that work. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, basically, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, interest problems in the design automation areas that you can apply machine learning. Uh, but don't just uh, uh, create a problem for machine learning. Um, I think they are good for uh, this four type of uh, uh, problems. One is uh, if the problem is uh, intractable or with high complexities, high computation complexities. Uh, so that way, basically, you're saving computing power. Right? Uh, if you, you take like days of the runtime, now it's a uh, you know, uh, machine learning model can influence very fast. Um, and second uh, area is things like uh, if you, have, you don't have analytical solutions. So basically, you don't even know how to compute. Right? If you don't know how to compute, how do you do it? Right? So, Use machine learning, um, and and third is like there are many conventional algorithms uh, in data automation areas that uh, uh, use a lot of uh, heuristics. Now you can use machine learning to replace those uh, heuristics uh, with basically a better heuristic based on the model. Um, and then the fourth and the, the most exciting area is like you know they call the really hard problems. 
uh, I would say like AlphaGo is kind of a hot problem, and we have really hot problems in design automation as well, such as how to do analog design. Uh, all right, uh, so conclusion is uh, we think deep learning and machine learning can really improve the quality and productivity of the automation in many ways. Um, and uh, uh, I think the research should focus on applying advanced DL, DL models uh, to really hard design problems. And um, uh, there's still a lot of challenges. Um, we have data set challenges. Um, unlike the other communities, the data sets uh, are not open in the uh, uh, design automation uh, the semiconductor industry. Um, and also, we have to solve model transferabilities problems and also uh, how we interpret the model, right? which is also very important. Uh, that's it. Questions? Yeah, so, uh, so it seems like you use some of these at NVIDIA. How long do some of these processes take? Do they run them overnight? Do they uh, take a week? Like, how, how long does it take to train them or? Yeah, it's, oh, I mean the, the training problem? Training or where? How long does it take? Uh, or you mean the training, the model, how long it takes? Or inference here. What's or inference. Oh, it's task dependent. Uh, depend on the uh, the projects. Uh, you know, some some data some you know some uh, if your data set is very small, then your training time is also very fast, right? But uh, we, for example, the testability project that we did, uh, the training time is like hours, right? Because we have uh, a circuit that has millions of nets, millions of uh, objects. Uh, and we are training for multiple designs, so that that takes hours, for us, okay. right? To train, but the inference is very fast. The so inference is like seconds, okay. Right. So, so that's that's one one example, right? Uh, there are other examples like something. Yeah, we we usually don't have things like uh, you have to train for you know several days. We don't have that yet. Uh, this is you, you know that's. Um, Unless we have really super big data set, and yeah. So I would say ours is kind of the limit right now, right? Yeah. Other than like productivity for your designers, developers, do you how much like um, efficiency or speed can you get out of the chip from like a completely novel design, say that a GAN came up with or something like that? Is there a lot of you can squeeze out of that. Yes. So uh, actually, productivity and uh, uh, and the quality is they, they are sort of like trade off. So if you have high productivity, you can always fine tune your design, right, with more iterations. So uh, usually the the chip is uh, 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 limited by the schedule, right. So I I have to release this chip by next and the end of next year or or, or whatever. So that means you cannot work on a lot of features. You can only do, you always have new features on the table. So if you have high productivity tools, then that means you have more chance to explore uh, more design ideas. And uh, from optimization point of view, there's also a direct uh, influence of machine learning to, uh, to the quality results. For example, we can do Using, using machine learning, like for example, the logic optimization uh, project we uh, talked about, that can directly optimize design to a better point that uh, cannot be achieved by conventional algorithms. And we can do design space exploration with machine learning, uh, which means you can uh, tune your parameters with machine learning that give you better space, like a, I mean, better design point, basically. Right, so there's, there's many different ways that you can call it directly or indirectly with productivity and Where are the waivers produced? I mean, did you check them here at all? Um, <laughs> sorry, that I cannot answer that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's uh, basically, uh, you know, there's only two companies in the world that can do Apps, uh, advanced technology nodes, so you know where they are. So. Um, yeah. Okay.
get a part of things to adopt some methodology that we have developed. Right? I'm sorry, uh, what question again? How do you get the product teams to adopt a new methodology that you developed? Uh, How do I get the product team to adopt the methodologies? Okay, yeah, so we basically do uh, some demos, like we show in this works, and uh, and then we work with them. Uh, because they, they will, product team has uh, larger data sets, right? So we, we show the results on smaller data sets, we say, okay, this works, and uh, you know, it gets a, you have data, larger data sets, we work together to build a better, better model. Um, yeah, and the, a lot of times we work directly with them even in the start, at the start, um, because we need the data, and uh, the other guys have data. I would, I would assume that there is some skepticism. <laughs> actually, it's not, uh, because the, uh, actually the whole company is like, uh, uh, kind of adopting the ML methodology, so everybody, uh, doesn't matter what kind of design they're doing, they know which part of the, the, the organization they are working, they, uh, they always want to, you know, try machine learning. It's like kind of like the the new new tool, right? Like everybody is running, trying it, and uh, it's very easy to sell like uh, machine learning. But it's difficult to uh, to prove that uh, your model is better, right? So so it's uh, it's yeah. I, I think that the transferabilities of the models are very important because everybody can have a training data set and testing data set and say.